It is my great pleasure to uh, introduce you uh, Professor Gianluca Setti from University of Bologna, same time University of uh, Ferrara. Professor Setti is going to make a talk today about uh, compressed uh, sensing from algorithms to circuits. Um, he is a distinguished lecturer of circuits and system society, which is a uh, supporter of this uh, talk today. Professor Setti is a well-known person in the society. He received uh, several awards worldwide. He was also a society uh, chair before. Same time he was editor of several, several IEEE journals, transactions, well-known ones. Same time uh, organized many conferences inside IEEE and the, uh, I'm really happy and appreciate he could join us today and he can uh, make a talk about his research. Uh, is it working? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, just, uh, I just add a few words about IEEE before starting. So it's, it's just to give you a data, IEEE is the largest uh, uh, professional organization in uh, the era of technology, it has about 400,000 members of all over the world. The interesting point is started uh, uh, as basically mainly a US organization. More than 90% of the members were from the US. But just recently, a couple of years ago, there was a typical, sorry. Oh, it's not working, okay. So uh, I was saying uh, the tipping point was a couple of years ago when the membership outside the U.S. become larger than inside the U.S. And this has been recognized. There are offices with the IEEE, which is op uh, were open initially in Asia. And one news that came just uh, last, uh, last month, three weeks ago, actually, the board of directors decided to open an office uh, in uh, Europe, actually in Vienna. And this is to increase the support of the member of, of Europe. So you will expect to get more service uh, in, the next, uh, in the next few years. Um, as uh, Norbert was also saying, uh, the uh, IEEE is organized in uh, society, technical societies. The Circuit Institute Society is one of these. And it published also plenty of journals, 160, uh, uh, and organized over 1,300 conferences every year. So it's, it's the main point is that it gives you the occasion to uh, increase your uh, knowledge from a technical point of view and actually to allow continuous learning through your career, uh, starting from the point when you are a student and uh, remaining a member till you actually retire and even, even later than that. Uh, but in addition of having the possibility to extract knowledge out of this event, out of this journal, uh, uh, or, or, or uh, these actually help you in, in constructing your own career, especially if you volunteer your time, as was mentioned by, by the section chair. So you can actually uh, provide your support for starting from, 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 from reviewers and going up uh, and doing uh, organizing, participating for this organizing committee for, for, for conference, being part of technical committees in the society. And that is actually very important because it gives you the possibility to meet your peer and share ideas even outside of these, these meetings, uh, building the possibility, the network that allow you, for instance, to uh, construct an European project together. So it's actually very important and give you plenty of good occasion uh, uh, to you if you just decide to volunteer part of your time. That's why I'm recommending you that you go and talk to Norbert because it's a good occasion for you. Honestly, I would not be here. I would not done half of the things I've done without uh, the support of the IEEE. And I'm very grateful, so this is why I also volunteer my time in coming here and, and, and talk about my research, in addition to, to be fun for me and hope for you. Okay, so let's start with the technical part of the talk. So, uh, first of all, the, uh, the thing that I want to say is that, as usually happens, when somebody's presenting something, that's not my work. That's not only my work, it's the work of a team of people. Most of them are represented here. My colleague, uh, Professor Riccardo Vatti from the University of Bologna, my younger colleague, Fabio Pareschi, who is an assistant professor in Ferrara, and some of our 
PhD students, uh, uh, two of them uh, left. One is in London uh, working for a company and another one is a postdoc at University Catholique of uh, Louvain-la-Neuve. The other two is one, one, one a PhD student and Mauro Mange is a postdoc with us. So I also reported some bibliography in case uh, you have uh, uh, need or want to uh, start to um, uh, know more about the topic I'm going to illustrate today. Uh, this is in terms of theory, uh, the algorithm for decoding, circular system implementation related to complex sensing applications. And these are instead the list of the contribution of our group uh, in this particular area. Also, if you just don't know anything about compressed sensing and you want to start by something, probably one uh, good reference is the special issue of the Signal Processing Magazine, which was published in March 2008. Then there is a special issue of the proceeding of the IEEE, the, of the uh, Journal of Selected Topics in Circuit and Systems, sorry, in Signal Processing. And the last one is the uh, Journal on Emerging Selected Topics in Circuit and System, which I highlighted uh, both because we guest edited it but also because it was sponsored by Circuit and System Society and is actually related also to uh, implementation and not only to algorithms. So if you're doing hardware, that's probably a good source of information. And if you just want to take it easy, we created also a, a web page. The address is there in which there is some uh, uh, basically starting point for compressed sensing. So if you really don't know anything, probably this is the first thing you may read and uh, starting from that to build all your knowledge. So let's start with the formal outline of my talk. I'm going to talk a little bit on sampling, just so that we are all on the same page in terms of terminology and notation. And then I introduce what compressed sensing is. I assume that, I mean, I, 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 either you are not familiar or simply partially familiar with that. So I'm going from the basics. I'm introducing what a sparse signal is, and therefore I need to deal with the corresponding basic expansion for a particular signal. Then I'm going to introduce compressed sensing, and in order to give you an intuitive idea, I will consider a signal as a vector in a three-dimensional space. Then we will see how one can, uh, reco one can uh, both sample and then recover uh, this sparse uh, signal in an efficient way, so improving with respect to what uh, Nyquist is doing, so with respect to uh, the Shannon theorem. And then we will see how it is possible to improve uh, um, classical compressed sensing. This is basically a contribution of our group using a concept that we call the rakeness. So at the end of this part, my, my real goal is to have at least one person awake in the room because this is a really uh, theoretical part. But if you just survive to this first part, then we are going to the part on circuit and system implementation and see how we can uh, construct what is co called an analog to information converter uh, based on a um, structure which is called random modulation pre-integration. We will actually implement the chip based on that. I will present you some uh, result of measurement and also a testing procedure for this kind of converter, which is mainly uncharted territory because that's not, uh, ch uh, they cannot be actually tested in the same way in which you test an analog digital converter. Then I can show you some applications which are mainly in the area of body area network, in particular how one can improve uh, signal acquisition for surface electromyography or also as, as this is a, a work that we started recently as a collaboration with some colleague at the University of Maryland College Park. So is EEG signal acquisition for recognizing schizophrenic patients. And finally, there will be space for some conclusion because certainly I have no time to, to spoke about uh, the embedded security in CS, even if I give you some details on this. So let's start with uh, uh, Shannon theorem. We all know that in order to uh, reconstruct a signal, we need to sample it at a frequency which is at least twice uh, its bandwidth, which is the called the so-called Nyquist rate. Uh, the beauty of this theorem, while obviously Shannon was a genius, is that these guarantees give us a sufficient condition uh, that guarantees reconstruction using the shannon wicktaker formula, which, give you, which can express the signal as a, a series of sync function. Uh, this is actually a complete general approach. There is no a priori information on the knowledge of the system, and is actually give you uh, the way also to reconstruct the signal. You simply need a low-pass filter. 
So this is really the most intuitive and used approach to sampling and actually uh, is uh, the most simple and general decoding and reconstructing solution because it gives you balanced resources both uh, from the acquisition and to the reconstruction uh, side. So it is easy to sample, it is also easy to reconstruct. Uh, the problem related to uh, this way of sampling is uh, uh, what happens if you go high in frequency because high sampling rate means high dynamic power consumption and especially if you have a wireless sensor network, if you have a body area network, if you have or if you go to the Internet of Things, you need to have these tiny nodes which uh, um, actually are going to consume as less energy as possible. So you need to be as uh, power efficient as possible and therefore you need to reduce the sampling rate as much as you can. Is this doable? Well, actually, uh, the Nyquist-Shannon theorem gives us only a sufficient condition. So in principle, you can violate the Shannon theorem and being able to reconstruct the signal anyway. So uh, there is no black magic here. Because basically what compressed sensing is doing is trading generality for sampling rate. So I will be able to acquire not any kind of signal, but a sufficiently large family of signal which have some particular property, but I can do that at a lower sampling rate. So in order to understand what is this uh, uh, structural property, well, let's consider this toy example. I have considered simply a sum of a sinusoidal tone uh, with uh, uh, this uh, uh, basically normalized frequency, that's uh, the plot of the, um, the uh, signal that you get. And if you consider the bandwidth, obviously, what you, as you expect, you have just eight tones, but still the bandwidth is quite large, and therefore you need to sample this signal at a, a very, very large rate. But come on, this signal has not a lot of information. Or if you want to say it in another way, if you consider a simple sinusoid that uh, it's, it's as, as a, a one, at one gigahertz, then you need to sample it at two giga sample per second. But if you just knew from the beginning that this was a sinusoid, you could actually use to sample and reconstruct it completely. So it's, it's uh, the real uh, information about this part of the slide is that the quantity of information which is contained on a signal is not necessarily related to, to this bandwidth. So it's, it's, there, is a, a, there must be some other way in order to determine this quantity of information. So the real point is how many significant terms there are in a representation of a particular signal with respect to a basis. So let's define a uh, basis uh, uh, function, uh, say uh, I call them uh, psi j, and I assume that they are orthogonal. So my signal can be expressed with respect to this basis as uh, uh, the ba uh, this uh, basic function here, while the coefficient alpha j are simply the, uh, uh, given by this expression, this is the expression of a scalar product. So what it is, alpha j, is simply the projection of my signal over the particular basis function. Hmm? So um, we define sparse, any signal which uh, can have this expansion, but only with a very few uh, uh, coefficient which are actually non-zero. So if we go on the previous example, uh, the sum of eight sinusoid, this was actually a sparse signal, an eight sparse signal because only eight of these uh, elements in the Fourier basis uh, were actually uh, 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 working. And in general, a signal is k sparse with respect to a particular basis formed by the function phi, psi one, psi two, psi n, if it can be expressed as a form of this, say, matrix here multiplied by a vector where, where this vector has only k element which are non-zero. So if a signal is sparse, obviously it's naturally compressible because only these k element are needed to know the entire signal. All the other one can actually be uh, thrown away, then can be completely neglected. So there is nothing again new here uh, particularly because uh, uh, this is actually what happens or what you do when you do, say, a, a, a waveless-based uh, compression. 
So uh, let's consider an example related to an AACG signal. I take a, uh, well, that, that's not the basis, but it's a dictionary formed by Gabor functions, uh, which are uh, weighted, uh, 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 actually cosine functions, so these are the representation of the Gabor function, and I can make a wavelet expansion of this uh, uh, part of EEG signal. If I do that, I obtain that the representation of the amplitude of the coefficient, uh, uh, the normalized coefficient on uh, the previous basis expansion, uh, it has a plot which is uh, done uh, more or less like this. This is a representation in dB, which means that there are several order of magnitude from here to there. So if I assume that uh, I can neglect all uh, the coefficient which are below this value, which is uh, minus 40 dB, so I can actually try to neglect all the coefficient here and I, I consider all the significant coefficient. And if I'm going to reconstruct the signal, so basically I take this wavelet transform and I take the uh, anti-transform, uh, then I obtain, by neglecting the blue coefficient, the reconstructed signal, which is the one in red, which is almost superimposed with respect to the original one. So this means that the quantity of information which is contained in the signal is only contained in this coefficient here. Uh, the problem here is that uh, I don't know how to extract this signal. So in order to extract this coefficient, in order to arrive to know this coefficient, I need to compute completely the wavelet transform. So there are actually good news and bad news. The good news is that most signal in uh, 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 the real world, all bio signals, for instance, are actually sparse. So this class of signal is quite general. Uh, the problem and the bad news is that I don't really know, uh, even if I, I have understood that sparse signal really do not contain a lot of information, at least do not contain as much information as their bandwidth would tell me, but I don't know yet how I can uh, acquire them in an efficient way. In order to give you a hint how I can do that, so let's consider what I'm doing with a Nyquist sampling. What I'm doing with a Nyquist sampling is simply a projection of my signal use, uh, uh, over delta function, right? So uh, the idea of compressed sensing is try to substitute the delta function with some other function, which is uh, uh, constructed uh, well enough in order to make this magic acquisition of only the coefficient that counts. And how can do that? Well, uh, how I, I need to choose this function phi j. Well, let's assume that the uh, signal is represented as a three-dimensional vector. So if it is the case, doing, saying that the signal is sparse means that it has only, uh, say, few components. If the maximum components are three, say the signal is sparse if only one component which means that in this in three-dimensional space, a sparse signal is something like that, like the one in red. So it has only one component. So if this is the case, then, there is no need to try to project the signal over the entire space. There is no need to try to find three coefficient, three uh, element of the vector. I could simply project the vector over a plane and do the acquisition there. Therefore, instead of having three sample to take, I have only two. And in this uh, uh, di di uh, two-dimensional game, well, I, I, could, uh, I could use this plane, and if I make the projection of this vector, which is aligned over A2, I, I, I obtain this alignment over the projection of the uh, axis A2, same thing for A1, same thing for A0. Where is the trick here? Well, I can choose any plane I want, uh, but not the plane which is orthogonal to any of these axes, because otherwise I'm losing the information in the case the vector is sparse ac across to that part the particular direction which is orthogonal to the plane. So that's exactly the idea that Candace and Don Ho had in 2006. They do exactly this. They acquire uh, uh, the com compressed samples using the projection of the original vector over a particular function phi j, 
where all these functions phi 1, phi 2, till phi m uh, are uh, uh, basically uh, chosen in a, in a, in a good, good, good enough way which are going to see how it is, and they are exactly the vector which uh, uh, define the equivalent of this plane for our three-dimensional space. So these are the uh, uh, equivalent of the vector that define the projection plane. So uh, the important point is that n would be the number of samples that I need to acquire using uh, the Shannon theorem, while m is the number of samples that I can uh, acquire using compressed sensing. So if m is less than n, hopefully much less than n, so I'm uh, uh, subsampling the system and I can actually acquire the entire signal uh, you spending much less energy. So, uh, <clears throat> the, actually, the Candace and Dono were actually able to prove that this is actually works, and so they were actually able to uh, uh, acquire signals at, uh, which is case sparse but n-dimensional in general, using less than n samples directly at the uh, analog to digital interface. Uh, from now on, in order to make the notation a little bit simple, uh, uh, I start considering uh, uh, signals which are discrete. So my signal x is not continuous time anymore, it's a vector in Rn, which contains, for instance, the uh, Nyquist samples. So if the signal is sparse, then it can be expressed as a uh, matrix vector multiplication where this matrix uh, uh, Psi is an n-dimensional matrix and contain all the basis vector for sparsity. And alpha is the same vector which has only k element which are non-zero in case the vector is k sparse. So this is what Candace and Dono were able to prove. In order to uh, uh, make sure that I can uh, uh, obtain this reconstruction, the sampling operation, which is, again, is a projection, right? We already know that, that, that sampling means projecting, and projecting over vectors. So, and since I want uh, less samples than the degree of freedom of my, my vector, so this will be a rectangular matrix. Uh, where the number of row is less than the number of column, and these give me the undersampling rate with respect to the Nyquist acquisition. What Candace and Dono proved, and the proof is far from being trivial, is that these two metrics, in order to uh, these things to work, need, m must be uh, incoherent, which means that I'm, I'm, uh, this is the equivalent of aligning the plane in the right way. So it's, it's, it basically tells you that the plane should not be orthogonal to these three axes here. So what I'm actually doing in this notation? So this is my, the vector that I, 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 I sh uh, is my, uh, the vector to acquire, so the one that in principle contains the N Nyquist samples of uh, a, uh, uh, an analog, an analog signals, which is sparse, so it can be expressed with this uh, matrix which define a basis, multiplied by the sparsity vector alpha. So in order to make the acquisition in, in, in uh, um, uh, geometrical terms or in uh, notation terms, I'm multiplying b by this uh, uh, acquisition matrix, phi, and what I obtain, so what I really am, am going to obtain out of my system is a vector of sample m, which are different with respect to the, those that I would acquired using Nyquist rate. So what I'm really doing, I'm doing a dimensionality reduction because I'm starting from an n-dimensional vector and I end up in having an m-dimensional uh, uh, number of samples. So uh, is this working? Hmm? So there are a few issues because uh, in order to, uh, to, have, to declare that this, this works, obviously once I have acquired the, 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 the sample y using this new methodology, I need to get my signal back because otherwise, I mean, I'm losing information, that's not something I want, I want to obtain. But in order to get my information, my vector x, my original vector x, I need to know alpha. And, and, and uh, knowing alpha means to solve this system, which is an undetermined system of equations, so it's impossible to solve. 
So how I can, I can uh, solve this? And also, uh, is there a way to ensure that there is a best possible choice for the choice of this matrix phi in presence of noise? Because what I'm doing so far is just an ideal projection, but I know that any time I'm going to acquire a signal using especially an analog circuit, there will be noise. And I need to do that in the best possible way because noise is independent with respect to the projection. So, and I need to avoid to lose energy any times I'm making this projection. So uh, that's actually uh, what I need to do. I need to make a projection which uh, almost conserve the length of any vector, almost conserve the energy. And this was solved in theory by imposing that the matrix theta, which is the product between the matrix psi and the matrix phi, satisfy what is called the restricted isomerty property, which basically tells me that for any vector alpha, there, are two, uh, there is a constant, delta k, which is uh, between 0 and 1, but must be very, very small, such that the uh, length of the projected vector, so its energy, the, 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 the square norm is the energy of the vector, is bounded from below and from above by these two quantities, which means that this projection is almost an isometry. So it doesn't really change the length of vector, it doesn't influence the energy. Uh, the first issue is instead solved by simply saying, well, let's look for the most sparse vector which satisfy the constraint Theta is known because I know psi and I know phi. So uh, I know uh, the vector y, these are the new samples, and my unknown is alpha. So to get alpha, I, I, I know that alpha must be a sparse vector. So I, I simply look for the vector alpha, which is minimize the zero norm of the vector, so the number of elements which are non-zero, such that the, uh, uh, this constraint is satisfied such that alpha is really giving rise to the element y which I'm going to sample with my system. So is this minimization problem solvable? Well, uh, in order to uh, uh, solve this, well, I would be, it would be very easy to actually uh, uh, solve this problem. It would be very easy to get my vector alpha if I knew the position of the k element which are non-zero in the vector alpha. Because uh, if I know, if an oracle tells me that, then uh, basically the only column which are the, uh, 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 in important in this matrix are those which are going to, to be multiplied by the element of alpha which are non-zero. But if I'm doing that, if k is less than m, then the, uh, the, the system that I need to, to, to solve would become not underdetermined, but overdetermined, so it would be very easy to solve. The problem is that I don't know the, where the elements are non-zero. I could actually try to get all the possible combination, and if I do that, I have n over k possible combination, which makes this problem an NPR problem. I don't know if you are familiar with what, what NPR is, but basically is the most difficult problem from a combinatorial point of view. Just to give you an idea, if I take a case in which n is one, uh, 1024 and k is 8, and I assume that for, uh, uh, for basically solving uh, uh, each of these, these uh, uh, inverse problem, it take me 10 to the 2 seconds, to, to, to solve all these cases would take me uh, 10 to the uh, power of 17 seconds, which is more or less half of the age of the universe, which makes this problem obviously a little bit unpractical. So that's not, that seems not to be the right way of doing. So what should I do then? I'm doing the classical engineering approach. So, well, first I look to a similar problem than the one that I can solve, that I can really solve, and then I hope for the best. So I hope that some clever mathematician helps me in proving that sometimes the problem that I must solve is actually coincident with the problem that I can solve. 
And you know, this time we are lucky because the problem that uh, we can solve is the problem which instead of putting a norm zero here, you put a no an, an one norm here. If you do that, this becomes a convex optimization problem which is easy to solve by linear programming in polynomial time. So, uh, and uh, the, uh, again, Candace and Dono were able to prove that uh, if uh, 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 the number of samples that I'm acquiring with compressed sensing is large enough with respect to uh, the sparsity level and the number of the degree of freedom in my vector, so n and k, so if m is large enough, practically most of the time uh, m uh, k equal to 4 times k works, then the solution that I obtain by solving the L1 minimization is equivalent to the solution of the problem that I must solve. So I'm really in business. These things work. Uh, just to tell you that there are plenty of algorithms to solve this minimization problem here. Hmm? Uh, uh, there, this is really an uh, open study. There are um, very, very efficient algorithms. Some of them are really uh, uh, solving the problem almost in real time. So it's, 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 I'm not giving you more details than that, but if you are interested, I can point you uh, in, uh, to, to, to some important reference. So let's try to recap what we've done so far. So we start with our enemy. Uh, my enemy is the Shannon theorem. I want to do better than this. Uh, what, I, what one proposed to do is to use compressed sensing, hmm, in which, in order to make this work, I have that my signal, the signal that I need to acquire, cannot be as general as you want, but must be sparse. Hmm? And we know what sparse means. There must be a basis, which is expressed by the function of psi, according to which only few elements of this basis are uh, enough in order to describe the uh, vector x. Then I am going to acquire my signal y, uh, my, my sample y, using a projection over a, a matrix uh, uh, psi, which uh, must satisfy the restricted isometry property. So the projection should be almost an isometry. And also, the matrix psi and the matrix psi must be incoherent. Hmm? So uh, I, 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 I must acquire something from any sample I'm doing. And I will see uh, in a moment how we can guarantee that. Well, uh, if we do this acquisition in this strange way, then we can reconstruct the signal by solving this minimization problem. And this is solvable and give us the real solution if the, the number of samples that I'm getting, so the dimension of this vector of samples, of samples is uh, large enough with respect to the sparsity value k. If I'm doing this, then the dimension of y, so the number of samples that I need, is hopefully much less than n, so I need less resources in terms of acquisition. So the most general case for uh, guaranteeing incoherence is just random sampling. So I'm using a matrix phi, which is full by uh, uh, IID random variable, and what people use at the beginning were Gaussian random variable because it's easy in this case to prove some theorem. Actually, it can actually be proven uh, that also if you use uh, um, Bernoulli variable, so binary antipodal, uh, you can actually obtain the same result. And this is actually interesting because this uh, came up to be a particularly hardware-friendly solution as we are going to see in a moment. So let me give you an example to see that this works. So what I took as an input signal, uh, I just took a, uh, some, some uh, uh, random vector. Uh, so the element of the <coughs> uh, non-zero entries in the alpha vector are actually uh, Gaussian random variable. That doesn't really matter. So uh, I actually took a k-sparse vector with respect to the Fourier basis. Uh, with a number of degree of freedom for my vector equal to 256. As a reconstruction algorithm, I'm using the L1 minimization. So this is the problem that I'm solving. So I'm taking uh, the uh, uh, vector alpha, which minimizes the uh, L1 norm subject to the usual constraint. So the sample y are equal to the matrix theta multiplied by the vector alpha. And as a figure of merit to see uh, if the acquisition is successful, I uh, use what is called the probability of successful reconstruction, which is the probability that the energy of the uh, original uh, vector alpha 
with, uh, over the difference of the energy with respect to what I reconstruct and what is the original vector is greater than 1 million. So as you can see, this probability jumped to 1, which means I'm reconstructing exactly what I was getting from the beginning. Um, if the uh, number of sample m is larger than a value, so which is between 10 and 20 here, uh, it is uh, after 40, uh, around 50 here uh, for the, for the uh, 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 yellow curve and so on, which is larger uh, uh, depending on the value of k. So if we take, for instance, k equal to 4, you remember m uh, is, should have been at least uh, 4 times k, uh, this is 16, and in fact, if I'm using m which is larger than 16, I get exactly perfect reconstruction. So this is uh, something that e theory tells us that works. Uh, there is a proof, but also if you do some numerical simulation because we are not convinced, that's exactly the same result we get. Something a little bit more, more real, a chunk of an uh, ACG signals. So in this case, uh, the number of Nyquist samples for acquiring this uh, um, chunk of, of signal should be uh, 256 if I'm, if I'm sampling with respect to Nyquist. Instead, I'm proposing to use only 55 measurement. So which means that I have a compression rate of about five. So uh, my metric psi is the dictionary of uh, Gabor Atom. And for a matrix phi, I'm using antipodal uh, uh, plus and minus one. So this uh, ACG signal was, was actually an artificial ACG signals. Uh, so that I could actually add noise, and I know that the intrinsic signal-to-noise ratio was 70 dB. As a figure of merit, I consider the average uh, reconstructed signal-to-noise ratio, which is defined as here, and which give me actually the uh, um, uh, signal-to-noise ratio due to the reconstruction error. So uh, if I'm doing uh, all the, I'm solving the usual minimization problem, what I get in this case is that the average uh, reconstruction signal to noise ratio is 15 dB, so only 2 dB is less than, than the original one. And what you can get is that the signal is uh, resemble enough the uh, original, uh, acquire, the, the original uh, piece of ACG. Obviously, uh, as you can expect, if I'm reducing the compression rate, I can get better quality. And in fact, uh, that's exactly the plot. So if I'm uh, um, actually increasing, in this case, the uh, undersampling rate, I get l uh, worse quality. So if I'm going the other direction, obviously, I'm increasing the quality. And in fact, if I'm passing from 4.7 to 3.5, I get almost a perfect uh, 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 reconstruction of my original sampling. So in this case, an uh, average signal-to-noise ratio of 20 NTB starting from an intrinsic signal-to-noise ratio of 30 dB. Okay, so uh, can we do even better than this? Actually, yes, if we consider that what we are trying to do for the acquisition is way more general than is actually necessary. So, Acquiring a, 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 a signal using actually random sampling is uh, needed uh, if we really want to sample something which is as general as white noise itself. But all the signals are actually characterized by a general by a, a, a energy which is actually constrained in some space. That's exactly the ACG signal. The ACG signal is intrinsically low pass. So if you are using this additional information, we can think to do better. And that's exactly uh, what we can do by uh, trying to define the vector of acquisition phi j to uh, 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 maximize what we call the rakeness. So the, we maximize the uh, energy which is uh, actually, we choose the uh, acquisition sequences so that the energy uh, for every sample is actually maximized. And we cannot maximize only this quantity, but we need to s also satisfy some uh, um, uh, random enough constraint. Remember, the phi j are random. They should remain random. What we are going to play is simply with the statistical property of the sequence. And we tune the statistical property knowing something more with respect to the family of signal that we want to acquire. 
That's, uh, uh, again, there is no black magic because with respect to signals which are sparse and, and, and nothing more, I'm using the knowledge that uh, uh, I know that the signal is also uh, um, uh, constrained in terms of energy, is localized in terms of energy. For instance, it has a low pass spectrum or a band pass spectrum or an high pass spectrum. So, uh, okay, so this is why the randomness is needed, but I can skip this detail. So, the point is we need to tune the statistical property of the samples with respect to uh, the, uh, um, um, say, the statistical properties of the signal that we need to acquire. So since we need to maximize this uh, 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 cross-correlation here, we simply need to tune the autocorrelation function of one with respect to autocorrelation function of the other. And that's not an easy problem to do, especially if you want plus and minus one. So if you want to design a, a, a sequence which has a, 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 a pre-designed pre autocorrelation function and you uh, want to have a real value, that's easy because you take a, simply a, a filter which was, which, which, uh, was, was uh, um, a transfer function is the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function and just stimulate it with white noise and give you the answer. But if you want to have plus and minus one, that's a much more difficult uh, uh, problem. There are a couple of solutions. This is the one that we, we, we designed. Uh, this system is obtained by considering a feedback connection in which here there is a, a finance impulse response filter, which is related to, which is actually the uh, uh, shape of the uh, uh, transform of the autocorrelation function that you want to synthesize. And if you just uh, uh, put here a, a, a um, comparison with this, this, this uh, uh, comparator of a um, uh, random value, uh, the one generated by a pseudo-random number generator, uh, actually what you get here is a stream of plus and minus one, which has exactly the spectrum that you want. So uh, and that's exactly the example. So this was the spectrum in, in, in black solid, was the, sorry, in green was the spectrum that we want to design. And in uh, black, there is the spectrum of the sequence that we generated using this particular uh, scheme. So what is the advantage by using this scheme? If we get exactly the same uh, example that we had before, and we are applying this new methodology for acquisition, so what we get that instead of having the uh, uh, dashed lines, we have the solid lines. So let me increase this plot to see it better. So as you can see, all these lines move to the left, which means that everything equal, I can get perfect reconstruction using, with the same level of sparsity, less samples. So I'm, I'm, I'm still reducing even more the number of samples that I need in order to get perfect reconstruction. So this is actually the uh, shape of the typical ACG signal in terms of spectrum. This is obviously the spectrum in case we use uh, perfectly IAD Gaussian random variable for acquisition. And if you use those which have been designed using this improved methodology, you get the spectrum which is in blue, which is somehow tuned to the spectrum in green. And these are the results in terms of reconstruction. So this uh, in blue, there is a chunk of the ACG signal. Uh, the, in green is what we can reconstruct using classic compressed sens uh, sensing. In green here is what we can reconstruct using our improved version. As you can see, the matching is much better here than here. And you can see that in terms of curve, which represent the average uh, uh, signal to noise, reconstructed signal to noise ratio as a function of the undersampling rate, the larger this is, the, more sam the less sample I'm using. Uh, this is the blue curve is the one using uh, improved sequence. The, the red one is using classical compressed sensing. I'm getting a gain which is about uh, uh, 5 dB between these two curves. And this is basically the main result of the paper that we published in 2013. The reference is here in case you are interested. Okay, anybody awake? I know that was tough. Eh? I'm, I'm perfectly aware that was tough. So I hope that you still uh, got something out of it. But uh, if this is not the case, 
uh, then basically what you need to remember from moving on is that there is a methodology uh, that allow you to uh, uh, compress, uh, uh, to, to sample m uh, samples instead of n, where m is much less than n. And in order to do that, you need to make projection, which means uh, uh, multiplication over a particular function, which is a random function, and then an integral, so you want to say a filter, in order to get this compressed sample. And if you do this, you can actually acquire everything at the rate which is much less than Nyquist. So, and the good news is that uh, this actually works and can be used for uh, a body area network because all biosignal are actually sparse. And in order to understand which is the architecture that we can use to do that, let again compare what we do with a Shannon acquisition and what we want to do with compressed sensing. With Shannon acquisition, we actually I'm going to uh, 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 project the, my signal over a delta function. I'm getting this sample here, the sample here, the sample here, all the samples having the different delta function every sample time. What I want to do here is something completely different. I have a, uh, uh, an integral of time, I, 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 the, the, enti the entire uh, uh, interval of acquisition, and uh, I'm simply going to use uh, a different sample function here. So if this is my first random sample, what I'm going to do, I'm going to sum uh, the value of the function here by this, func this value here, the value of the function there by this value here, and so on. And I'm going to collect just one sample here for every function using this formula here. So which means that in order to have a possible architecture that there are many of these, but this is the most used one, in order to implement directly something like this in M, uh, pos for M possible function, I'm, I simply uh, can uh, have a, 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 an obvious structure which is uh, implementing this operation M time in parallel. So what we have here, uh, the input signal, then I'm going to multiply it by this uh, pulse amplitude modulated function, which is the random function here. And then um, I need to do the integration here, so I can obtain a filter or say, a, a, if this discrete time, I could be a switch capacitor filter. Then I'm going, I need to sample here. And then obviously uh, I need to convert into digital because I still want bits to go on. And that's basically my acquired vector, which I need to reconstruct at some point at, uh, in the future using a minimization, uh, the solution of the minimization algorithm. Okay, so uh, where is the problem? Well, you can see the problem here. So I need to make a multiplication of analog waveform, and since I know that there are a lot of analog designers in the room, you know that this is a no, 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 if you can, because uh, designing analog multipliers is one of the most difficult things to do. So uh, one uh, uh, good, uh, this is why having a binary antipodal random sequence instead of Gaussian random sequences is actually uh, doing the trick. Because uh, in discrete time, this simply means uh, if you are in a, a, a fully differential configuration, it simply means to switch the uh, polarity of the signal. So you need a couple of switch to make this multiplication, which is obviously much easier. Uh, this slide is simply to tell you that you don't need actually M uh, of the analog to digital converter. You, can, you just need one plus a uh, multiplexer, which is exactly the structure that we have used. This slide simply tells you that the performance in terms of reconstruction are the same if you use Gaussian acquisition and binary, so no need for that. Uh, to give you more details on that. And that's actually the structure of the analog to information converter that we designed. So this part is uh, uh, completely, the, the, the part here is completely standard that a, a successive approximation uh, analog to digital converter. This is the part uh, which is actually making the random modulation pre-integration in a switch capacitor form. This is designed single-ended. The uh, true implementation is fully differential. Uh, just to give you some details of the implementation, so there are uh, mainly three problems to solve in this case. The first one is that you need to take particular care for the minimization of the leakage current. And the reason is that in this case, you, what you need to sample 
is something which is the sum of, this, of the uh, uh, sample of the original signal multiplied by this vector of plus and minus one. So you need to have a charge on a capacitor which stays there for longer than usual uh, so that you are going to sample the, 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 the good value. And there is I mean, really no solution for this than try to minimize, minimize leakage current in the best possible way of using large capacitor. The other point is that you make sure that you need you no, no uh, uh, pieces of signal are lost if you pass from an integration time to the next. And in order to do this, you actually use an interleaved configuration with two feed, feedback capacitors, nothing again very special there. And one, and one important point that is usually neglected in a theoretical result is that you need to, to consider obviously the effect of the saturation of your amplifier. So uh, in terms of, uh, to give you more details, so if you want to integrate this uh, first frame, what you actually do, you use uh, uh, the um, uh, first two, uh, the two up capacitors uh, in, in this uh, uh, fully differential amplifier, so, uh, uh, sorry, fully differential integrator, and when you uh, go to the next phase, you just put the input of these capacitors uh, at the input of the analog to digital converter in order to make the uh, uh, integration. And at the same time, you start sampling using the other two capacitors, the second frame. And again, you just reset these two capacitors and you can use the second capacitor at the input of the analog to digital converter in a usual interleaved configuration. So nothing fancy here. Uh, the interesting point is what happened in terms of saturation. What is the problem here? Is that what I'm going to acquire, as you can see, uh, if you just go, the, you, you do your computation, is simply the weighted sum of the uh, sample of my input, input quantity. And <coughs> these, uh, these uh, uh, function here are, are my plus and minus one. So the value of yk that I need to acquire is uh, 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 something which has not the same dynamic range of the input signal. And if, since these variables are uh, a random variable, according to the central leading theorem, the, the yk are actually distributed as Gaussian. And so the uh, uh, value of the dynamic range of yk is theoretically unlimited. Obviously, if you do this dimensioning in a probabilistic term, you can actually uh, want to uh, use this uh, dynamic range, uh, which is large enough uh, in order to not have saturation, but is also small enough in order to not waste resources. So let me try to explain you why this is a problem. You can have two kinds of saturation in the circuit, which is exactly the representation of one of the channel of the circuit here. So it's the same as, as one of the channel of this. Uh, is exactly this uh, with a single-ended configuration. So let's go back to the, re the, the real slide. OK. So and I can have two kinds of saturation. The first one is the saturation of my ADC. So and uh, the saturation can occur uh, when I'm going to sample. So at the end of my integration period. So if I have a good measurement, obviously, when the input is in the dynamic range of the A to D converter. And obviously, if I'm going to saturate here, then I can actually recognize that I've saturated and simply discard the sample and use another one. But what happens if I'm going, if the operational amplifier is saturating? Saturation here can occur at any time during the uh, integration step. So the integration step means that I'm going to have the output, which is this brown curve here. And there, is no prob there are no problem here. And I can have saturation at the input of the ADC, but not saturation, for instance, at the, at the output of my operational amplifier. So no, no problem, because I'm not acquiring anything. And the problem occurs, oops. And the, oops. OK. And the problem actually occurs here. It occurs here because I have saturation of the operational amplifier. And due to the next sample, I should go up. I cannot go up, I, and, and I'm staying constant. And then the two trajectory becomes are, are absolutely the same. But as you can see, the yellow one at the end end up to be something which I can perfectly convert, 
while the final one here is something that I could not even convert, but anyway is different with respect to the other. So if I am doing anything, if I'm not doing anything, if I'm behaving exactly as theory tells me to do, I'm getting something which is definitely completely corrupted and not convertible. So what we propose to do is simply to record the instant of saturation and then to paddle zeros, so basically transmit the time in which saturation occur and then discard completely the sample. That's actually quite interesting because if you do that and you use the information of the time of saturation in the reconstruction, you can get better result than in the case in which you don't do this. <coughs> so uh, that's the uh, details on the uh, implementation of the SAR, but there is nothing, nothing fancy here, so I can skip that. That's a picture just simply to say that there was an implementation which was made uh, in Texas Instrument Technology that was a, a project that we did in cooperation with them. Uh, these are the performance of the circ circuit. The results are reported in a paper which is, uh, well, is already in the pre-published list since a few months and published in Transaction on Biomedical Circuit and Systems. Um, that's the testing board. So this is actually our chip. Uh, that's, uh, uh, there is an FPGA which is actually uh, generating the uh, necessary control signal. And then we have uh, an external digital to analog converter uh, to uh, supply the input signals to our chip. And basically what we did, we uh, um, downloaded some uh, uh, real uh, ACG and AMG signals from the FusioNet database and these, we programmed the, uh, di the digital to analog converter in order to uh, feed the signal into the chip. So the problem is how you can test this analog to information converter because this is not an analog to digital converter and so you cannot simply use a sinusoid uh, or uh, as you would do for, for analog to digital converter. So that's the uh, performance of the signal, uh, the, the SAR. Uh, there is nothing fancy here. You just do the usual stuff, uh, spurious free dynamic range, uh, compute the uh, integral nonlinearity, uh, determine the effective number of bits, which is about nine, so not too bad for, since we are not a designer of A to D converter, so we were quite happy with that, even if it is not obviously uh, comparable with the state of the art. So uh, in order to test the basic functionality of the system, we took the most simple sparse, sparse signal, which is uh, a signal which is formed by uh, simple pulses. And uh, uh, there are, uh, say, 20 pulses uh, here. So the vector is 20 dimensional, but only two are non-zero. So the vector is too sparse. And uh, uh, if this is uh, uh, the signal that I need to acquire, then uh, the, only, the, the, the measurement uh, can only uh, come up with four possible value depending on the fact that uh, my vector of plus and minus one is plus one and plus one here, uh, minus one and minus one, plus one and minus one, minus one and plus one. So now I have only po four possible value which are 1.8 or 1.08 and the inverse of that. If I'm going to uh, uh, acquire something which is according to this formula, simply the sum of sample multiplied by plus or minus one. So that's exactly what happened. So if I'm using this sensing vector, what counts are obviously only the second and the, which was the eighth element, the second and the seventh element. So, and if I'm doing that, these are the value of the oscilloscope, which are exactly as expected, either 1.8 or 1.08. So that's basically te simply testing the basic functionality of my uh, uh, test bed. Uh, this is the proof that I can actually reconstruct. This is the original signal, uh, which is uh, um, the one which is represented with cross. The one represented with the uh, uh, um, uh, circles is the reconstructed signals. As you can see, there is almost perfect overlap. Even if I would find something which is very, very low and non-zero, even in other element, and that's the result of my minimization problem. So um, what you can <coughs> get is that the average reconstruction signal-to-noise ratio is about uh, 37 dB with a, a, a signal to a ratio for the measurement, which was about 39. Uh, let's try to change, uh, let's try like to complicate uh, the sparse signals, use a, 
uh, uh, signal which is sparse with respect to the uh, Fourier basis. So uh, the time window would require the, uh, 64 samples in this case. Uh, I'm uh, uh, considering a, a signal which is uh, three sparse, so only three of these tones are actually non-zero all the time. And instead of uh, acquiring 64 samples as I should with respect to this particular setting using Nyquist, I'm using only 16 of the channel, which are all the channels which are present in my chip. Uh, I'm, I'm doing all the uh, computation using the uh, sampling and the reconstruction using the uh, 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 um, compressed sensing theory. And what you can see, the blue curve is the original signal and the red curve is almost superimposed and is actually the reconstructed signals. Uh, the average reconstructed signal to noise ratio was in this case about 30 dB. So this is uh, uh, varying the frequency of the signal here actually helped me in determining a, uh, the frequency range for my signal. So if I'm plotting the average reconstruction signal to noise ratio, I can see that this is basically almost constant at, at increasing the wind of length, so at decreasing the uh, frequency of operation till a point in which the performance degradate completely and this is due to the leakage. So this is actually due to the fact that uh, what I'm going to sample is not anymore what I should sample and uh, this turning point uh, helps me in determining that basically the minimum operation frequency for my switch capacitors is about uh, uh, 0.6 Hertz or if you want 1.6 second in terms of uh, minimum times of operation while the maximum one is about 120 kilohertz. So this is uh, the uh, um, way of testing that this uh, uh, saturation checking that we have seen uh, 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 is embedded in the chip actually improve performance. Let, let's look at this curve. So uh, I'm t I, I took the previous uh, uh, signal here and multiply by quantity S which is uh, uh, before actually uh, uh, acquisition and reconstruction, uh, which is something which could be one, and this gives me exactly uh, what it should be. And if I'm increasing S, I'm actually uh, increasing the probability that the amplifier is saturates. If I'm decreasing S, I'm obviously decreasing the probability of saturation, but I'm using the uh, 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 dimensioning of the circuit in a bad way because I'm actually acquiring uh, samples which are not that large using a very large dynamic range. So basically I'm putting too much noise into the system. So what is happening is that if I'm increasing uh, uh, with respect to uh, um, one, I mean, I'm, I'm increasing the number of saturation and the red curve is what you can get in terms of uh, uh, a reconstructed signal to noise ratio if you use if, uh, our proposed smart saturation checking. And if instead you don't use that, you, sh you, you see immediately that the, the, even if you just saturate one time, the performance uh, uh, basically uh, don't uh, uh, go almost to zero. And the reason is that we are designing a system which is really operating on the edge of what it could be. So even if I'm losing one sample here, um, I cannot reconstruct anymore. So I really need to use the saturation checking. And as you can see, even with uh, 10 saturation checking, which means uh, that even if more than 60% of the measurement saturates, you can reconstruct uh, with a quality which is not great, but at least uh, intelligible. These are the results for the biosignals. So that's the original ECG signal taken from uh, Fisionet. Uh, uh, the sampling frequency uh, for the signal was 256 Hz, according to Nyquist. So I'm using, instead of uh, acquiring 250, uh, uh, say, for a, a window of 0.5 seconds, I should acquire 128 samples. I'm proposing to acquire only 16. So the compression ratio in this case is 8. And this is the reconstructed signal if you use the standard CS. Okay, it is remembered this, but is not quite. So which means that 16 here is actually uh, uh, low because the uh, uh, Shannon theory should actually, uh, sorry, the CS theory should tell you that for this case of uh, sparsity, 
you should have at least 32 of the samples. So I'm using only 16, and in fact, the quality is low. But if I'm improving using, uh, uh, if I'm using the uh, rakeness uh, uh, coefficient, the rakeness sampling vector, I get something which is almost identical with respect to the original signal. And also this work, even if I'm increasing S, so even if I'm saturating, basically the quality of the uh, uh, signal doesn't degradate. Uh, interesting enough, I trained my uh, coefficient with respect to a ECG of, of an LT patient. What happens if the patient is sick? So if the ECG signal I need to acquire is completely different with respect to the one of an LT patient, still the reconstruction is uh, definitely satisfactory, even if I have uh, saturation events uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the circuit. Same idea using EMG signal. The only thing that changed is that I need to use 24, 24 channels, so I need to use two chips in, the, in this case. But again, I get much better performance even in case uh, of saturation if I'm using reactions uh, with respect to the case in which I'm using standard CS. Same thing if, if the patient is sick, so a patient with a myopathy or a patient with a chronic low back pain, again, uh, the uh, uh, EMG signal can be uh, correctly acquired and reconstructed. So uh, I just give you still five more minutes and then I'm done, uh, just to give you two examples of application. The first one was the acquisition of electromyographic uh, uh, signals. So we did this in collaboration with a group in Turin, which is actually uh, as this uh, uh, sensor, which is simply made by, by pins and what they want to use is to want to, they want to recognize uh, movement of uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the arm uh, and, and actually basically of the end in three different uh, positions. Basically the fact that the end is, is open, the fact that the end is close to a fist or that you try to grip something. And in general, uh, you do that by acquiring the uh, electromyographic signals, which basically means uh, uh, having a sensor transmitting a lot of samples. And these lot of samples, uh, usually, if you need to sample at 4 kilohertz, which is the state of the art, and using 12 bit per sample, for 16 sensors, this means to transmit basically 60.5 megabyte per second, which is quite a lot. So you need to compress, and we wanted to use compressed sensing. So this simply, these two curves tell you that the reconstruction, if we just, uh, as, a, as a function of the compression ratio, so the number of uh, sample according to Nyquist over the sample of compressed sensing, is, uh, is the usual decreasing curve. So uh, the more you compress, the lower the quality, but the acquisition using the rakeness sequence is uh, usually better than, is much better than the standard one. And these are example of original signal, the reconstructed one using uh, rakeness CS and using standard CS. This one is much better than this one. What is more important, however, is that I really don't need to reconstruct in this case. I, what I need to do is just to recognize the three position of the end. So I don't need to reconstruct the signal. What I need to do is train some classificator, in this case was a neural network, so that it recognizes the three, the three elements. And as you can see, this is the point where, where no compression is present. And if you just use a, a, a Rakeness a CS, basically the uh, uh, um, number of time, the average number of time in which you have correct uh, reconstruction, this parameter ARR, is basically maintained constant if I'm having a compression which is almost seven. So I can have a compression rate of seven without losing anything in terms of capability of reconstruction. Uh, another, the last application, which is the one of trying to monitor a schizophrenic patient. Here the patient is actually uh, imagining to hear a noise, and so what we have worked is to try to uh, uh, acquire, uh, evoke uh, uh, potentials uh, from ACG signals. So uh, just this slide simply tells you that uh, uh, standard CS is not good enough for this problem, but the one using rakeness is. But the interesting point is here. Uh, you have, uh, in your EEG signal, you have, of course, a lot of electrodes which are mapped in, 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 in the head with these uh, um, mapping uh, uh, pictures. And in order to remove uh, the, um, 
uh, unwanted physiological sources, so basically the fact that I have artifacts or uh, uh, environmental noise, uh, or which means the fact that I have, say, a 60 Hz component uh, due to the, 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 the power rate, or uh, that I may have sense of mismatch, one of the electrons may detach. Uh, so all these sorts of noises usually need to be, uh, not usually, need to be removed, and what you do, you do three kind of filtering classically before acquiring the signal. So what is represented here is actually what you can get uh, by using the, uh, say, the, one, one of these uh, approach, which is the um, sensor noise suppression for eliminating the environmental noise. So that's the original signal, and the one is, is the map for, the, for, all the elect for, the, for the energy of all the electrodes in the original signal, and this, is what is, uh, this signal here is what is reported in the uh, um, sensor, which is exactly at the middle of your head. And this is the, um, uh, let me see, is the uh, blue signal. Then you have the one which is uh, reconstructed after uh, uh, acquisition with the uh, uh, filtering effect, uh, the classical filtering effect, which is the red one. And you have the black one, which is the one which has been acquired and reconstructed using Rakeness. So you see that, okay, the, 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 the average behavior seems to be what it should be. The interesting point is that what happened in terms of spectrum, so if you use these Reken sequences, you're actually going to eliminate the uh, uh, component at 60 Hertz, which is the one present due to, the, due, due to ambient noise. So, which means that if you're acquiring using CS, you can get rid of one filtering needed uh, uh, in, in case you are acquiring using the Nyquist sampling. And the same thing happened for uh, the presence of high frequency components, which are due to the fact that one of the electrodes moves, and that's exactly the electrode here. There is a lot of energy here, and that's exactly due to the fact that the electrode is moving. So if, um, if you just use the uh, standard filtering technique, Instead of the black uh, curve, the, the, the blue curve which is there, you acquire something which is more close to reality, which is the red one. Uh, if you use rakeness based compressed sensing, you get the black one, and again, you get a much better filtering effect of the high frequency component than uh, uh, what you um, get by standard filtering. So the message is, if you are acquiring using CS, you can actually uh, t since the uh, statistical uh, features of what you need to acquire is tuned to what you should acquire, basically you can uh, save some, some, uh, some filtering which is classically used. Um, just I skip completely this, that's the part uh, on showing you that if you use this methodology you have some embedded privacy which is absolutely guaranteed and I arrive to uh, the uh, actual conclusion so we have seen that CS is a way which has attracted a lot of attention in the signal processing community to uh, acquire signal with the number of samples which are less than what is required by Nyquist. Uh, it's actually require, in general, significant algorithm uh, circuit co-design, something on which the circuit and system community is good at, so it's really good if you are active in this area to try to look at this problem. It has a lot of interesting things to see. Uh, in order to design an um, uh, analog to information converter that actually works. And the important point is that if you use it for one of these tiny nodes, then the privacy of your, your signal can actually, at least some privacy can be guaranteed for free because you need the perfect knowledge of the uh, uh, acquiring metrics in order to reconstruct the signal. So these are the contribution of our, our uh, um, uh, group in the different areas so that you can uh, look at the reference in case you are interested at. And then uh, with this, I conclude and I thank you for your attention and I hope that you find this information at least partially useful or at least thought provoking. Thank you so much.